of all, may I invite the representative of Bird Watching Society, Mr. Don, uh, come to the stage and then uh, give a welcoming remark. Thank you. Oh, I'm so angry. Uh, well, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. This is because of you. You're a professor of Okay, uh, yes, uh, you are Tom from the Hospital Society. I'm the research manager of the office. And we always, we always encourage our members to observe the birds because this is uh, the basis of all different, all things. Uh, mostly for science. Uh, we always emphasize how important the good observation of the birds can contribute to the contra uh, conservation and also for personal life. And you will enjoy the watch very much if you know the details of the birds. Tonight, we have a very good example from Professor Morton. So, well, he will tell us how to observe the birds and to see how to study the birds. This is always, this is the thing we always tell our members how important uh, the, con uh, the, the observation could be. So, um, yes, I'm very nervous because I think the last time uh, myself and Professor Morton in the same classroom is about here, 20 years ago. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I'm a student, uh, so uh, I remember the last course we, I took from him is oceanography. So, yes. Um, what was the grade? <laughs> <laughs> quite good, quite good. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for coming, and then I just save the time for Professor Morton. Uh, so, yeah, please, Professor Morton. So, because uh, Professor Morton need one more minute to walk up. <laughs> so, he wants me to say a few words about his personal life. <laughs> He's handsome, also available. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, when, when I was young, uh, I worked in the Swai Institute of Marine Science. Pine uh, was the founding director of the Swai Institute of Marine Science uh, in, two, in 1999. Sorry, 1989. Sorry, when they built the foundation, it's 1989. And they start the, the operation in 1990. Um, now, uh, um, if I look back, I, the first leaflet I got from the lab was uh, on birds. He actually drew all kinds of seabirds he encountered at Capacular. It was really impressive. He, he, he drew every single detail of the birds. If you uh, read his book, uh, Seashore Ecology of Hong Kong, you will see every single uh, habitat. He will draw the birds. Bird is a very important part of the ecosystem. They are not just a predator at the top, but they are also a very good indicator of the health of the ecosystem. When you see the birds, many different types of birds, that means the ecosystem is very good. So you can ask Adon, we are facing a lot more trouble now. Uh, we used to see the big, big pelican birds, right? But they are disappearing. So it's something uh, uh, concern about us. So, and um, without further ado, are you ready? Yeah. So, okay. Final announcement is please consider buying his new book. Okay, <laughs> okay. please welcome buy. Thank you guys, thank you very much. Um, there's more people here than I expected. Do you want to take my jacket off? <laughs> no more, that's it. That's not more. <laughs> Leave the trousers on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. So, I retired from the University of Hong Kong, as you know, um, 2003, and arrived back in England on 2004, early 2004. I bought a house in London, got fed up with London, changed one dirty city for another one, and so I bought a house on the south coast of England. And uh, I think this poem says it all about me, really. This is a poem by Arthur Hugh Clough that talks about the tides, especially estuaries. And I love that sort of concept of the water flowing in. Anyway, never mind. Here's the book, and here's the subject of the book. Early, 
named after my father, Ernest. <coughs> now, this is a small town where I live on the south coast of England, and it's got a small river called Yarrow, which has its headwaters at a place called Horsham, who a lady here just, has just come from, and it flows down to the coast. <coughs> and in it live swans, new swans. And this bird here is one of England's swans, which is the royal bird, which is, we shall see why soon. <coughs> now this swan is native to Europe, but it has been introduced in over 50, 60, 70 countries, including Japan. There's a stamp with a mute swan on it. <coughs> Denmark. Now Denmark's in its norm normal range. Even Monaco, Czech Republic, and of course this is England where it's dated, and you all know the song. Christians amongst you must know the song called Made of Christmas. Yes. And so this bird is really very well known in the sense of its very wide distribution. But I've also put on here the top one, the black swan, which I shall be talking about later. And the swan is very famous. It's put on the swan fest of matches. Anybody know swan fest of matches? They're red. Anyway, no, it's also in Denmark. It's on a mar margarine tins. So it's a well-known bird, well-loved bird, and it's full of Irish fairy stories. For example, this one, the children of Lear, and you can see they're changing from a swan into young maidens. And you notice that the swan's got something around its neck. <coughs> I'll explain why in a minute. There's another fairy story, the wild swan by the Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen. <coughs> and um, he wrote this poem, or Yeats wrote this poem about them. It's lovely. It was changed as I hear it at twilight. The first time on the shore, bell beaters, when they flap their wings, they really make a bad, loud noise. It's called sluffy. And um, it's a lovely, it's, you know, it's full of poetry and literature and everything. So we'll see more about it in Europe. So this is called Doggerland. And it was the end of the last ice age. And as the ice melted, the seawater came back in and flooded it all, separating Great Britain from Europe. But anyway, the point is, the swan could have been there at the same time. Just as humans were there, coming across from Europe, post Ice Age, so the swan could have been there. And we know from archaeological history that swan bones are recorded from Iron Age settlements. So they're not brought in by Richard Kerr de Lyon, but they're there all the time. Now, this is England up here with the coast. There's my river Arran, as you can see it's tiny, but once upon a time, this is France and so on. That river was enormous running in between, between <coughs> Great Britain and, and Europe. Well, you're one of the biggest rivers in the world. These things like the Seine and the Rhine were just tributaries of it. Bobby. So that even until relatively recently, Britain was joined to Europe with a huge river separating separating the two. And these hunter-gatherers who lived there would have been hunting swans. 
If you ever go to England, there's one place you can see a lot of them. And it's at a place called Abbotsbury in Dorset. And these new swans number in their thousands at this one place. This is because <coughs> King Canute, anybody know King Canute? Trying to send the tides back, was Danish. And when he came to the throne of England, <coughs> he said, these swans are mine, unless I give you permission to have some. And they established one of these swanneries at Abbotsbury. In, you know, very early on. We're talking about, you know, a thousand years ago. <coughs> and this is the only one that's surviving anywhere in the world. <coughs> and there's thousands of them. They can come and they can go, but they all come back and they're fed. And it's called a game of swans. G-A-M-E, -A, -E, a game of swans. And they all <coughs> live here. I've never actually been, but I'd love to go. But I will one day. Anyway, could I set this site up? And in that, those days, they were farmed. They were farm animals. Flocks of them. And it's not just here. Everywhere in Britain. Mostly England, because as we shall see, these new swans don't like the cold. So, <coughs> all this royal stuff comes from Canut, and all the way down to British royalty. So there, for example, is a picture of them. And to see how valuable they are, these people belonging to the crown are capturing them and putting rings around their neck, around their legs. <coughs> two other bodies, two other livery companies, the companies of dyers and vintners, winemakers and hair dyers or clothes dyers, are identified as legal owners of swans or the River Thames, as is the crown, Queen Elizabeth. Nobody else is allowed to have them. <coughs> you know, you can't control the whole country. So occasionally, they, they do get killed. But anyway, every year, in the spring, they capture these swans and they ring them. One leg for the crown, one leg for the other companies. <coughs> and they check them and weigh them and do things. But here you are, this goes on today. This still goes on today in the Thames every year, this ceremony. And here they are capturing a whole family and they're going to ring them. <coughs> no. No. <coughs> the interesting thing is um, St. Hugh of Lincoln had a swan as a bodyguard. This thing used to sleep with him. Now don't, you know, and if anybody came into his room while he was asleep, not the, not the swan, St. Hugh, the swan would see him off. And you'll notice again the ring around the neck. Because, <coughs> of course, he, these people were very powerful, you know. So he's got this sort of, gold everywhere. But anyway, <coughs> St. Hugh is also the patron saint of swans, but also sick people and shoemakers. I don't know why shoemakers are so important. If you go to this place in the Bath and Wells, it gives you a clue how they, they became domesticated. Because when the Normans came to Britain and killed almost everybody except my ancestors, <coughs> they had moats around their castles. And these castle moats you know, were full of vegetable, rubbish, garbage, 
humans, excrements, everything went into the mud, making it perfect for swabs, because it all produced green algae, you know, which they love. But here, today, you can go to the castle of the Bishop of Bath of Wells, and the swabs will ring for their supper. <laughs> I think, I think the important thing about it is to give the clue as to how they began to be domesticated. <coughs> and, you know, everywhere you look, you find these songs with the royal or kings of the house of Lancaster. You know, it was, they missed out on, on royal two royalty. But anyway, even in Denmark, you understand there's a very close relationship between Denmark and England because of the three kings. <coughs> right. So much so that they began to clip them. First their toes, well their toenails, the toes, and then their bills. And each had a marks cut on their bills to identify, a bit like branding a cow, to identify who they were who they were owned by. And <coughs> they were slaughtered in their thousands at feast times. Now, you can't imagine the numbers that were killed at an important feast when a new bishop was installed or a new prince came to the throne or something. You know, thousands of these birds were slaughtered. Uh, but the likes of you and me, well, the likes of you, not me, but were prohibited from catching on pain of death. They were so expensive compared to a chicken. So these things were, you know, like prized cattle. And you'd still see them at Abbotsbury. So here's my river. <coughs> and the Duke of Norfolk is a direct descendant of a Norman, Norman conqueror. And the Bishop of Chichester was also a Norman. And they've got castles at the north and a castle at the south. And it controls this cut to the South Downs, down towards the sea, towards where I live, just there. Anyway, they were kept here too, on the river in the thousands, and owned by these two people. The river is the black line, is how it is today. But the yellow and orange is how it was before it became cannibalized. <coughs> we shall come back to this any minute. And here we are, Arundel Castle, Amberley Castle, the cut through the downs, and the view across the floodplain. A beautiful spot in the outside. <laughs> now, now, there's another reason why swans are so loved. Courtship. When they court, when they make love. Let's come together like that in the form of a heart. So you know as well as I do that when we talk about a heart, I love you with all my heart. A heart is a red blob or throbbing muscle. <laughs> <laughs> that is the origin of a heart. What we perceive to be the heart. And they do this at the end of the courtship. <laughs> but not just that. <coughs> They're simple, though erotic, love. And it begins largely with Leda and the Leda and the Swan. Leda was Leda was seduced by Zeus, who's the top god. Roman God. He seduced her, and from 
their coupling came. Who's the guys in the trunk of the wards? I can't remember. Anyway, that's a mosaic that's in Cyprus, which I've been to see. Very famous mosaic of Lena and the Swan. But this is by Rubens, and it is extremely erotic, but it is not the most erotic. So on the internet tonight, <laughs> have a look, and you'll see Leda being seduced by Zeus. <coughs> There's not actually, not only the mute swan, there's other swans in Britain, and these are two of them, the Berex and the Hupa. These are migratory. They only come in winter, and they only go to a few places. More north of England, often in Wales and Scotland. And these two swans are also, you know, big, like, what, like the new swan, but they're much rarer. There's another swan. There's another swan in Britain. And this is the black swan. There it is. And it was discovered by French and British and Dutch um, explorers in the Swan River in Perth, West Australia, and brought back to Europe. It was brought to England, but we don't know who by. It was also brought to Napoleon as a present for his wife. <coughs> They were given to the Empress Josephine for her menagerie in the gardens of her, of her, of her, of her palace. <laughs> and you can just see there are black swans on the lake, along with kangaroos and cassowaries, which these guys brought, brought back from Australia all the way, just for, just for um, Josephine. And, by the way, this is the first zoo. Let me think about it. First time anybody put together a collection of animals. Remember that. You can go to Dorset on the south coast of England, and there's a family of swans that live there, and occasionally they come to one river, the Arran, and then they come for a day, and they're off. But they live, do live now, they are now resident and breeding in Britain. <sighs> so here's a range of them. And as you can see, they're scattered throughout Northern Europe and Russia, mostly. <coughs> some of them are resident, some of them migrate. And about, I think there's about 20,000 in Britain. 20,000 birds, but you can see that the approximate distance. And these are different genetic groups of them. Is a better picture of them in concentrated in Western Europe. And as you can see, very few of them in Wales, one or two in Scotland, Ireland, so most of them in the rivers of England and Denmark, Netherlands. They meet them all in France. <coughs> and uh, that's that. Now, while you're trying to read this, I thought I'd better synthesize a few of the facts. <coughs> some of them were resonant, some of them not. They're pure white, which is unusual for a bird. And it's thought to be a sign of, hey, look at me, I'm huge. You know, keep away. It's not trying to hide, it's trying to display him or her, so it's called continuous advertisement. The neck has 25 vertebrae, unlike our seven, and the giraffe's seven. And they have this knot on the top of the nose just there, and a wingspan of two and a half meters, taller than me, much lower up there. They live for about 25, 
It varies considerably. In captivity, they can live for, for over 20 years. But in the wild, it's much, much shorter. <coughs> They're hugely territorial. The male is considered to be insanely aggressive. And we shall see that in a minute. <coughs> Usually about four to ten eggs. The, the eggs are laid once every day and a half or so, but the female doesn't incubate them until they're all laid. And then she incubates the lot. And thus they all hatch on the same day. The chicks all hatch on the same day. So <coughs> and they molt for a period of two months when they're very vulnerable. And as we shall see, mortality is very high. Oh, that will become later. They stay with their parents for less than a year, you know, when they reach full size. And they don't move far from their parents. Right, and here we are. This is how they take off. They need about 30 metres runway, you know, Boeing 747 type thing, to take off with these huge wings. And they are vegetarian. And these are photographs I've taken of them feeding on weed in the river, on weed in the sea, on fields of vegetables, which I'm not sure the farmer thinks too much about. They'll eat grass. They'll eat anything that's vegetable. <coughs> For such a big animal, they need about four kilos a day. And then, <laughs> I love this, they can uh, get weed in, just like ducks, they can up end and get deeper, get food from deeper in the water. And here, you can see they've got these spiky mouth parts inside rows of spikes that allow them to crop weed or grass or something, but it also makes them extremely aggressive and dangerous if you get too close to them, especially the male when he is um, either courting or looking after the cygnets. <coughs> you can tell when they're aggressive because he will show his wing feathers up high and if he becomes really aggressive, and you should be getting out of the way when he does this, this is the before busking, and it is the time when he's going to attack if you don't move. And there's the aggression which uh, these birds show regularly during the summer, early summer breeding season. And they do almost all the other things, like they preen themselves and wash themselves, and you can watch all this going on almost any time. Night or day, they sit in the sleep whenever they feel like it, floating down the river and sleeping. And they swim sometimes with one foot in the air. It's a bit like a sort of, I don't know, resting, resting with your feet up, putting your feet up. You just put one up. You see how big they are, the feet. So when they're on land, on land, that's really quite weird. The huge feet. <coughs> There's the knob, by the way, on the hill of the building. You can see it. Now, this is courtship. I'm not going to a great deal about the courtship. You can see what it involves. A lot of touching, a lot of displaying, Head waving backwards and forwards, you know, crossing over. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of kissing going on, a lot of water cascading down with the sun glistening. Oh, it's really erotic. And then they, they get this um, love posture. You have to forgive some of my photographs because I've only got a tiny camera. The river's quite big, and these bloody things do it miles away. 
So the courtship, you know, goes on in the spring. You can always tell when it's starting. And they, uh, they couple up. And there's mating. This is this is my couple on the t on the Aaron. And the unusual thing about these swans is that you've got a bifurcated penis. <coughs> yeah. It's bifurcated like that. And the, as you're sure the bird watchers know, this is because they're copulating in the water. They don't the sperm washed away. It has to be with a penis. <coughs> it lasts seconds. And they've seen it twice. And each time it's pure chance you see it. And then there's the signet. Typically eight signets are produced. And uh, they get they are guarded by the female. Mostly by the female. In fact, she will do virtually all virtually all the incubation and so she doesn't eat for over a month. She doesn't leave the nest. She loses a third of her body weight over the incubation period, just from simply being unable to feed. <coughs> and the eggs there, uh, on the left is a new one, on the right is an older one. It's getting thinner as the chicks, the signets, absorb as calcium. <coughs> and the female has a brood pouch, pulls out the feathers from here on her chest. So they get the flesh, warm to the eggs directly. This patch, well, it's seen in, in a number of birds, but uh, it's, it's used to keep the eggs warm, of course. And then the signets hatch, they're white to grey, and they slowly go brown to, as they grow older and older. And as I said earlier on, they talk to each other through the, through the egg casings, egg shells, and they all communicate. And the female can hear them, and she can hear how <coughs> she can hear their progressing, and it forms this bond, of course, between them. And you can see the egg tooth at the top, <coughs> and that's one of the families that is one of my females, that my male. I had as a partner, and this is seven of the signets that hatched. I think this was 2016. <coughs> they have to begin feeding instantly. They've used up all the yolk. She's lost a third of her body weight. They're straight down the river. As soon as they all hatch, they're in the river. And they need to drink as well. Before. So there's Ernie. At the top is Ernie. He's a big bird. He's very aggressive. He must be about. The reason I wrote this book now because he must be coming towards the end of his life. He must be at least 18, 19, 20. At least that. And he's big. He's got a huge knob on his head. <coughs> highly aggressive. Highly territorial. And this on the left is his first partner, and this one right is his second. And I, I had to draw them because I had to see, I had to recognise them. <coughs> I shall show you some photographs in a minute, which will show them. Because when we look at them, they all look the same, but they're not. So here we are, <coughs> early in the middle, and you can see his bill is broader, a brighter red, Elsie's is orange. This is a different shape. The nose on the two are very different. The nostrils. <coughs> so you slowly pick up the fact of how they differ as individuals. And then, you to spot them. <coughs> now there used to be about 50 of these birds on my river. There's hardly any, there's not so many now, but they, they used to come here regularly until the, the local council decided to rebuild the sea wall, the river wall, and then they left, but I shall explain why. 
But then they love feeding on this scum, the fighter packed on the scum that comes in with each tide. <coughs> and they used to roost on the, on the town quay, where they're, as we shall see in a minute, is neutral ground. <coughs> Ernie and his first wife, Elsie, had a nest right beside that shed. And there's the nest. She died in 2011. <coughs> and because of that, it was abandoned. And I was able to go and look at it. Now, I wouldn't do it if she was sitting on it. But that was what the nest was made of, any old rubbish. Bits of old pieces of everything, you know. But um, that was early and his wife and his wife's it nest, which they came to every year. They came back to every year. And slowly but surely, it's called, we called it Brian initially, but that is Ernie's territory, the red in red. And this blue is where other swans could go if they wished but not in here. Not even an inch in here, except for the town key, which is neutral territory, they could all go to and be fed by the local people or be given fresh water, again, by the local people. And so this <coughs> game of swans, about 50 of them used to come in here and feed in this part of the river. And that's all mine, said Ernie. <coughs> so this is the earliest map uh, dated uh, just after 1066 of the of Little Hampton, as it was, as it is called now, but was just this. There would have been swans in, of course but people would have had them almost certainly. So there's a river looking north, and there it is looking south, and this is all Ernie's territory. And that's other swans. They can go there. <coughs> in, hatched in blue, and the, the river has made a cut through the downs, forming a northern freshwater floodplain and a southern estuarine marine floodplain. And Ernie lives here. The rest of them fly up and down between the two places. All the other juvenile birds, unmated birds, live up there. And they fly down to the river to feed in that one bit of the river here. And then they go back home apart from Ernie and his families down here. Then you can see the northern floodplains where this river just explodes from its banks when, with heavy rain. And there it is, the swans coming down to feed on the algae at the bottom of the, of the river. <laughs> There's my house somewhere. Anyway, now, in the early maps, of the river, River Arran, three little islands are identified. One, two, and three. And Ernie and Elsie's nest was on island two, opposite, opposite my house. <coughs> and this is how the river's floodplain originally. And they produce a brood of cygnets every year. Five, six, five, five, two, three, one. Oh, she died. And was found on the other side on the bank of the river. So the survivorship of these cygnets as she aged fell just like that. And then she died. I have no idea how old she was, but um there we go. 
For two years, Ernie was without a partner. He was especially aggressive. <laughs> As you can expect. But he did mate in the second year with Elizabeth. But not on this safe island. Not on Elsie's island. But another one. <coughs> and in the spring of the first year, Elizabeth laid four eggs and they all disappeared. They were possibly taken by foxes or by humans, but they all went, so they had no, no, no secrets. She, she was not, I think she's a young fellow, and she didn't have much common sense. Anyway, <laughs> so that's going on. But then another pair of swans arrived. In 2014, <coughs> two swans, who I call Frank and Hilda, named after my aunt, one of my aunts and uncles, <laughs> turned up on the river and started to nest. I mean, all hell broke loose. Ernie was beside himself with fury. But they nested, or well, they tried to nest, on the town key, daftest place in the world to nest. <coughs> uh, as you can see, they laid eggs, three eggs, two of them simply disappeared. <laughs> Human collected them, and then they tried to look after them, but dogs with no leads on harassed them, and they failed that year to produce any chicks and their eggs were all taken. This is a male. Frank is at the top, of course. Now, on the, on the opposite side of the road, where Elsie, sorry, Ernie and Elizabeth are nesting, they produce their first batch. At the same time Hilda and Frank were coming to nest, Ernie and Elizabeth were trying to nest on the other side. But it was pissing with rain when they hatched. They tried to get down to the river. They got, they slid down to the river with all the signets. And then they couldn't get back up again. It was too slippery. And they were stuck, covered in mud. And the local wildlife, wildlife hospital captured them and got them cleaned up and unfortunately only a few of them survived. <laughs> in 2014, 15, 16, 17, Frank and Hilda attempted again and again and again to nest on Elsie's old island. But Frank was harassed and harassed by Ernie until Eventually, he gave up. He simply stopped coming. But Hilda kept on coming. Now, this is a slightly complex, but this is where Elizabeth, sorry, Elsie died. This is the original <coughs> nesting site of. Frank and Hill, Frank and Ernie and Elsie. That's the nesting site subsequently. And this is the town key. This is where Frank and Hill tried to nest it. And this is neutral territory, of course. So the different nesting sites are all identified where the two ladies, it's the ladies who decide where to nest, by the way. It's where they decided to Lay the rest. Now, eternal love, swans kissing, love forever. Something very strange happened earlier on this year. Love, partners till death do us part. Wrong, because on the 6th of May in 2018, having just driven 
Hilda away from his territory, Frank decided to have sex with her. Outside his territory. With Elizabeth sitting on the bloody desk watching. <laughs> and <laughs> it was, I mean, I was just totally, I was totally confused. <laughs> Until I started reading the literature. There it is. This is Elsie and Ernie. Sorry, Ernie and Hilda. Disgraceful. <laughs> In front of the children. It was not right. It was consensual. And we now know, through DNA publications of these ones, that it is common. Common. For, for male birds and females outside the partnership, that's it. They are not monogamous for life. They often have sex, and both sexes do it. And it turns out, as I'm sure our bird watcher here will know, in fact, most birds do it. Very bit like humans, actually. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it, but. It, and I had my camera. Just pure fluke. Pure coincidence. <coughs> In 2018, we are coming, we're up to date. To give you an example of what happens with mute swans. They had, they laid eight eggs. One was adult, you know, unfertilized. Seven hatched, they went to the water, four were died, four died immediately, well, just simply gone it by the next day. I have no idea what happened to them. And only three had survived. Um, well, one of them was eaten by a crow, we know that. <coughs> you can see them watching this crow. <coughs> and one of these eggs, from a previous year actually, fell into mud, and I found it. But the, the interesting thing about it was, the anoxic mud where it had fallen into highlighted all the pores on the shell. You know, when you look at a bird's egg, you don't notice the pores, but of course they have to, don't they? They have to respire, they have to lose carbon dioxide, they have to, you know, get rid of excretory products somehow. And the whole eggshell is covered in a pattern of pores. <coughs> so here we come then. There's Elsie's broods when she snuffed it. And then along comes Elizabeth. She's young, very young. She always lays seven eggs, which are fertile. And then up until 2016, she had an enormous success. And now she's slowly declining again. I haven't gone any farther because I will keep on watching them, of course, but I think Ernie's time is coming. <coughs> no, there'll be another male swan sometime. And as you can see, mortality is typically greater than 50%. Typically, usually. This is the last one of the last photographs I took of them, taking the three signets upstream. And he he's doing something I've never seen before. He's sort of reeling the mud. I've never seen that. <coughs> I don't know what he's feeding on, but he's doing that. <sighs> so much as we love these birds, and we love their partners and their signets. We also see that they are of another side to their lives. They are extremely aggressive, and adultery is common, and survivorship is not very long. <coughs> I have sort of uh, talked about there are many threats to threatened mute swans, but um, I think the time is getting on. Yes, yeah. What? I'll just show you a few pictures, just, I'll go through them quickly. Oh, I've got to do this first. 
This is my great, great, great grandfather. And he's holding a quill pen. A swan quill pen. My great, great grandfather was a quill pen maker. Swan quill pen maker. Isn't that funny? Isn't it weird? After five generations, I come back, and there I am. Anyway, and they get covered in oil. This is near London, oil slicked. They get poison from lead, which produces a characteristic bend in the neck. They get tangled up in fishing lines. They feed on dirty water, because there's, when it doesn't rain, they have no choice. So this is the road drain their feet wash feeding on, they're drinking from. But some like local people put out buckets for them of fresh water. And they unfortunately people feed them. So these are the green feces of a, of a, of a normal bird. And this is just bread and chips from a bird that's been fed. I actually like bread and chips. It's not good for fond. <laughs> We're trying to stop it in the town by not feeding the gulls. But the gulls are a pain in the butt. <laughs> anyway, there's the characters in the story. And as you can see, you know, if you look at them carefully, just watch. Don't make a fuss about things, does it? Yeah. Oh, thank you all for listening, Graham. Really excellent talk, like a detective story. So uh, now open the floor for any questions oh, yeah. to buy. <laughs> yes, any questions? We are asked what did they do during the evening? In a bar. What oh. did they do in the evening? Well, I'm normally in bed, you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you this: they are just they are almost as active, I think, at night as they are during the day. They just sort of sleep when they feel like it. Yeah, just a second. Yes, please. Yeah. Are they these milk swans? They're not the milk. No, they're not mute, no. <laughs> <laughs> are they deaf? No. How do they know? Because they make sounds. No, are they deaf? I mean, no, no, they've got ears. You just can't see the ears. They don't have a pillar like us, just a hole so hidden by feathers. But they do make sounds. The, you know, the yeah, they're a bit sad because they're not mute, but they, they may be still in death. <laughs> that, that may be why they're both so graceful. Well, I've never seen one with a hearing aid, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're deaf. They're just very quiet about what they say. Not like some people I know. <laughs> <laughs> any more? For any more? Yes, if you have a taste of swan meat, you really want calm, so it's safe to admit it if you have. And what does it taste like, do you know? No, I've never eaten swan meat, it's illegal to do it. <laughs> but I can tell you this, if you go on the internet, there's a sense that they're being farmed in China. Huge mm -hmm. It's not, I've only ever seen really one advert on the internet. But I think that you Chinese guys would be able to find more. <laughs> well, I think they're eating now in China. Farm. But who cares? They were farmed in England. One of the reasons for their success is that they were farmed and protected. Yeah. Well, I have no idea. I've never eaten. Anyone? Mr. Lee? Yes, Joe. Brian, you mentioned that there are 50 birds around that area. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seems to defend and own a big territory yeah. around that region. Yeah. These yeah. are 15 birds actually defend. And so, what do these other birds do? So they they're all juveniles, unmated juveniles. So they're waiting to. They're waiting. Yeah. So, where do you think they actually potentially um, nest? Because so many birds, such as the snow here. They nest in that northern floodplain. And they, well, they, first of all, they roost there. They go out and forage as groups. And I don't know how, there are points out in the book, how the hell do they all turn up on one farm where spring greens are growing? I mean, who tells who? But they all go out and forage during the day. Some come down to my end of the river and say, but early won't let them into his territory. Then they fly back again. So they're roosting up there. And I think, 
that there'll be others might be nesting here as well. But it's a difficult area to get into. So I haven't done it much. I only take a few photographs. Now I can't really answer your question, Joe. But they don't move. They don't move from their natal birthplace very far. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the newborn bird, yeah. it's just a human newborn baby. Yeah. How they feed the young one at night? They don't. Do they need them? Um, no, they don't feed them anything. Huh? Newt swans do not feed their young. They have to learn the very first day they hatch. They have to learn by watching their parents what they are feeding them. Any more? Three more? Any questions of students? No? Mm. Yes, please. Uh, do they have natural predator or the species? Oh, yeah, the signets do. Foxes. Foxes in particular. Big crows. Yeah, they'll take them. Is there any chance to do a little I don't think so because they're not the most intelligent of animals, first of all. <laughs> in fact, you know. These signets die. Over 50% of the signets that hatch die. And these ones don't seem to give a shit, you know, they just carry on with life. You know? They can't count. Counting is a very human thing. It takes us years to count, learn to count, doesn't it? Oh, mum, one, four, seven, no, no, three, yeah. The birds can't count. So, the bird watchers used to tell me that they go into a hide, four bird watchers would go into a hide, and one would come out, and the birds would think they'd all come out. <laughs> so the three bird watchers in the hide have now got swat birds all around them, but they're quite happy there's no humans around. They can't count. They have no idea when what happens that the bird that one dies. <laughs> They show that they want to come back to the family and they do it sometimes for up to about 18 months but only will, as soon as they lose those brown feathers and go white, click, on goes the light, competitors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yep. As soon as they go white, he would have had nothing to do with them after that. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah I thought so as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I slowly put the picture together. I can't tell you're very busy in your retirement. <laughs> you yeah. have to do this survey every day. No, I don't do it every day. You know, sometimes I stay in bed for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now yeah. may I invite uh, Yu Yatong to give a silver there as a token of friends to buy it. Please join me to thank Brian once more. It's just uh, the bed of UK. So, most importantly, Bai is still here, happy to sign the book for you if you buy it tonight. Very special occasion. And also, there will be another talk about the beautiful Weir Marine life in Hong Kong and elsewhere on this Saturday morning, 10.30. The talk will start around 11. But if you want to have your signature again on Saturday, Please come early because we're expecting 300 people there. <laughs> that talk will be very exciting because he tried to sum up what he learned from Hong Kong since he was a juvenile. <laughs> See that? <laughs> so please join me to thank Brian again. Thank you very much. <laughs>